Welcome back. Weeks of fierce fighting in Iraq has led to a threat of a civil war. Is the international community doing enough to end the bloodshed? What will be the political fallout for U.S. President Barack Obama if the situation deteriorates? To discuss all that and more, I'm joined by David Gartenstein-Ross, a professor at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Professor, thanks for joining us. As we heard from our reporter there, the battle is intensifying. ISIL now taking control of a border post, a refinery. It controls significant parts of Iraq right now. Is Iraq losing this war? Excellent question. One thing we should specify at the outset is that even though the media and the Iraqi government both tend to lump all of the forces together as being ISIL, that's not the case. You have instead an offensive that's being undertaken by multiple factions here. ISIL has aligned itself with Ba'athist factions. It's aligned itself with al-Qaeda loyalists. ISIL itself got booted out of uh, al-Qaeda back in February. But if you look at the, the fighting that occurred around al-Qaim, one of the border posts that was taken near Syria, it's it seems that actually the Nusra Front, as opposed to ISIL, was primarily responsible to, for that, as, as well as tribes. That's another part of their offensive. Sunnis who are discontent with uh, the Maliki government's rule, who believe that it's overly sectarian. So uh, the reason I emphasize that is because that also indicates some of the fragility in what ISIL has done. Not only is, uh, do many analysts believe that they're overstretched, and I share that view, but also they're dependent upon a uh, coalition of multiple groups that have very different interests staying together. And you can already see a little bit of fraying at the seams. Around Kirkuk, you've had some infighting between members of ISIL and former Ba'athists, but it's not clear that that's going to spread throughout the entire movement. But at this stage, they do control a significant part of the country. Absolutely, they do. And what you're, what you're going to see next is a counteroffensive, which is going to be led by the Iraqi government. They've amassed a lot of forces. Around Samarra, for example, they have 50,000 troops. Iran is, is certainly going to be helping them, although probably in a quiet way as opposed to a loud way. Uh, the United States has already announced that it, too, is going to play a role, uh, which is probably going to be, at least at this point, very limited. Uh, the president didn't announce drone strikes, but at the very least, provision of intelligence is something the U.S. will do. Right. About that, United States help. Secretary of State John Kerry, of course, has been in Iraq. He's been holding talks in Baghdad as well as in Erbil. He says the United States will provide, quote, intense and sustained support. What does that mean? Not clear at all. Uh, if you look at what uh, Obama announced uh, very recently, uh, to put it mildly, it wasn't earth-shattering. Basically, all the policies, other than sending 300 military advisors over, were things that it was already clear the U.S. was doing. Now, part of the reason I think that the U.S. has been so hesitating um, is that it wants to exert pressure on the Maliki government, perceiving the Maliki government and its sectarian pro-Shia rule as being one of the problems, one of the things that's driving people over to ISIL's side. Another reason I think the U.S. has been so piecemeal uh, in its policies is, as the president stated, um, the United States believes, in my view correctly, that groups like ISIL tend to alienate the population, and so time isn't necessarily in ISIL's favor. They also want to see what local and regional partners are doing. If you look back to the president's West Point speech, he said very clearly that local and regional partners are key to combating violent non-state actors and jihadist groups, as opposed to the U.S. always having the lead. Well, what you said about al-Maliki, I mean, that raises the question, is he going to go willingly, or if not go, relinquish a significant amount of power? I, I, I don't know of, of any world leader who, in the midst of an uprising and a major national crisis, is going to abdicate power. I mean, Ben Ali did, but uh, he's the exception rather than the rule. And in Ben Ali's case, that was very explicitly an uprising designed to overthrow him. Th this is, is much broader. I mean, if you look at the Shia population of Iraq and, and others, uh, they, they really fear ISIL's advance. I mean, if, if you look at the videos that ISIL has released, it has brutal execution videos where they're slapping Shia soldiers who they've captured and then executing them on camera. This is a very sectarian statement. And so it's not as though the entire population of Iraq is anti-Maliki. Now, you do have blows to him. For example, Ayatollah Sistani, the most uh, important Shia Ayatollah uh, in Iraq, has called for a new government that doesn't repeat mistakes of the past. And that is a significant blow. Uh, but looking at Maliki's record, there's nothing that indicates to me that there's a real likelihood of, of him abdicating. Instead, he almost certainly is going to, to try to maintain power throughout this crisis. Right. You mentioned Iranian involvement earlier on, and we've known for some days now, some weeks rather, that there have been reports that uh, units of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard are in Iraq already. Uh, are we going to get to a situation where the United States and Iran are going to be on the same side here? Well, yes, uh, but l let's not take that too far. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the U.S. was also on the same side uh, as Iran 
uh, in the beginning of the Afghanistan war. You know, Iran had been involved in fighting against the Taliban uh, for, for years. It had been supporting the Northern Alliance, for example, because it saw the Taliban's rise in Afghanistan as being inimical to Iranian interests. So, yes, the U.S. and Iran are on the same side, but that doesn't really make the two countries partners. That term is thrown around a lot, a partnership between the U.S. and Iran. But if they're actually to be partners, there has to be some kind of you know, concrete cooperation, and I don't see that that's occurring right now in the status quo. Yeah, the thing is, a lot has happened since the Afghan war, of course. I mean, the relations between Iran and the United States have deteriorated considerably since then. Uh, and if Iran uh, does help uh, the United States in Iraq, is there going to be some kind of linkage? Here? Is Iran going to say, well, look, we'll do this, but we need easing of sanctions, we need to get a deal done very quickly on the nuclear issue? You see signs that Iran is doing just that. It's unclear how successful they'll be. Uh, one of the reasons why is that uh, Iran is way more threatened that by this than the United States. Uh, ISIL is you know, a virulent Sunni organization. It's very anti-Shia. Iran has significant interests in Iraq, more so than the United States. So if, the, if Iran is able to take this situation and successfully leverage the United States, then Iran uh, has some fabulous negotiators, and we're not um, doing a proper job of assessing relative interest in what's going on in Iraq. Right. You know, I talked with uh, Paul Bremer, the last U.S. representative in Iraq, uh, and he says, look, we won the war. Uh, this was a victory for Iraq. This was a victory for the United States. But when we look backwards at this, there wasn't the kind of threat posed to the United States and its allies and European countries, etc., that ISIL now poses. Uh, he told me at the time, Bremer told me, well, look, Al-Qaeda was in Iraq at the time, uh, and we defeated them, and, you know, that's questionable. But if you look at the situation then under Saddam Hussein and now, it's got worse for the United States, hasn't it? E absolutely. Um, I, I think the Iraq war was uh, one of the, the key errors that the U.S. has made uh, over the course of, of the past 13 years. Um, U.S. interests were very much hurt by that war, including uh, both the blood and treasure that we expended uh, and the, the threat of terrorism, which was the specific uh, threat that ended up prompting the U.S. to go in, got worse in Iraq after the United States undertook the Iraq war. Professor David Gardenstein-Ross, thanks for joining us. My pleasure.